kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion Stop the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Welcome to Jinx Church Online. We're excited you guys joined us today. Uh, make sure you check out our website if you're new here, uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or, or Facebook. Go over to jinxchurch.org, check it out. Uh, stuff that we've got, some videos for our youth, some videos for our kids, as well as upcoming events and the exciting things. And that's a great place to fill out the digital connect card, which allows us to contact you and you stay up to date on all of the things we've got coming down the tracks, like when we're going to reopen in a few weeks, hopefully and prayerfully and all of those things. So if you want updates, reach out to us through there. If you have questions, reach out to us through there and uh, somebody on staff here will get back to you this week. Also, make sure uh, if you're part of our Jinx Church family, if you haven't done so, make sure you're, you're clicking that Give tab or uh, whether it's a one-time gift or the reoccurring gift, which is easiest so that we can partner with you and we can begin to plan out and uh, just do some amazing 
works in our community, so we always appreciate those that give regularly and give one time, so thanks for all of that. Hey, not a lot of announcements today, just check out the website. Thanks for being here, and uh, yeah, we're excited to have you join us today as we worship and as we get into part three of winning. Welcome to Jinx Church. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Vision. 
visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above and echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song.
Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength. Listen, if, if you don't win in this this journey, this race that we call our relationship with God and salvation, nothing else matters. What is the cost of winning? Well, what is it going to cost? We talked last week about sacrifice, of discipline, of, of making your body a slave. Like we, but what we, what we say is, is we love these things, but today I don't want to approach this concept with that in mind. I want to give you a definition of love, that love is is determined by what you're willing to seek out and what you're willing to sacrifice for. Because we love based off of what we're willing to give up and to go do. And because we're not willing, we can't imagine a God that would love us. There's no way God can love me because of the mistakes I make, the the scars, the baggage I carry around with me. There's no way God can love me because what I've done. There's no way God can love me because what what I'm in the middle of, what I'm stuck in, the cycle that I'm in. Because we knew Jesus once, we were close to him once, but we don't really know where he's at or where that leaves us now. And for how many of you watching today, how many of you, that's your story? You're watching and you would say, you know what? I used to be close to Jesus. I knew him once. I used to be aware. I used to be close to him, but, but not anymore. What I want you to hear today, what I want you to hear above everything else, is God loves you. And God cannot wait to be back with you. And so they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Because without Jesus, there's no winning. There's no victory. There's no satisfaction. There's no fulfillment. Your your win is just to receive Christ. Because He's seeking you out. He's paid the price for you.
welcome back to our winning series. Uh, for those of you that don't know, my name's Dave, and I'm on staff here at Jinx Church. And coming to you a little differently this week, as as we kind of sit at a table, we wanted this visual of of not some guy on stage just giving information, but we really wanted to come at this, and we will a couple other times in the next few weeks, as a conversation. Um, Jesus never shied away from conversations. He was asked hundreds of questions. He usually answered those with hundreds more questions of his own, but he always wanted it to be a conversation. And so while today and in the future, we'll touch on subjects that uh, we want you to win at, and we think are important that we win at, as Christians, as, as believers, as followers, as we hit some topics that God wants you to win at. Uh, we want it to be an ongoing conversation. We, we don't possess all the answers, but we want to help you help ourselves just begin this journey of winning, uh, winning in areas of, of life and arenas of our life that matter most. And so today, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, uh, a man that that I have so much respect for, and the more I read, wasn't a perfect man, but was a man that that wanted to win at at his passion, at, at his life, that wanted to win in the in the arena of social justice. And it wasn't that he wanted to be right, even though I believe he was. Uh, he wanted to make a difference. And so, with that context, we we come at this topic today. We're going to talk about how we win together and, and predominantly how we win together in the middle of our racial differences, uh, in the middle of, of cultural differences. And while I'm going to talk about some principles today, some biases that have to do with race and, and how we see one another, it's not just race. Uh, it's political. It's gender. It's, it's socioeconomic. It, it's all of of these things. And so we want to come at this idea. We want to define the wins of how do we win together? How do we win unified? Uh, I read uh, just an amazing book recently by a pastor from San Diego, a uh, former NFL football player, uh, just a really interesting guy, uh, Miles McPherson. And, and his book called The Third Option, he, he talks about this. And so some of the information you hear today is going to be information that, that I got from his book because uh, as an African-American man, he, he has a perspective I'll never have on all this. And so today's a conversation, today is information sharing that's not all ours, uh, but we feel it's so important to talk about and to share and to get out there. Uh, today, as we talk about this idea of, of winning together, it's how can God bring us together? And, and when you think about it, that's huge because we live in an us versus them culture. Uh, we, we live in an us versus them culture, whether it's, whether it's what the TV tells us or what our family tells us or what social media, right? It, it divides us. It, it puts us on one side or the other. It, it challenges us to pick sides, uh, to pick teams, to be, it's either us or them. And, and once, once you're either for or against something, you're either for or against the police. And you can never, you can never switch sides. And you're either for the Democrats or you're for the Republicans. And no matter whether you agree with something the other side says or not, you can never admit that out loud. It's, it's a constant us versus them mentality. You either watch Fox News or, or CNN. You're either pro-immigrants or, or you're anti-immigrants or, or whatever it is. And, and that's what the devil does. The devil has created a culture of division. But God, God's all about unity. God wants us to be unified. He wants us to win together. And when we can take our eyes off of all of the us and thems in the world, and we can fix our eyes on Jesus, when we can see his plan, then we begin to see that we can bridge this gap. It's what brings us together. That it's not just us and them, as McPherson says in his book, there's a third option. There's this option in which we can honor all that we have in common. We can honor what we have in common with each other. In Joshua, in the book of Joshua, in the Old Testament, Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. And as he prepares this battle plan, as he gets ready to go in to this war against Jericho, uh, the commander of the Lord's army shows up. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but I've got to think it's a pretty awesome 
sight. I mean, dude's got to be ripped or something if he's, if he's commander of the Lord's army. But Joshua looks at him and he asks him an us versus them question. In Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and he said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Joshua asked the question, are you for us or are you for them? Because if you're not for us, you've got to be our enemy. If you're not for us, you've got to be against us. Because, see, that's what culture does. Culture gives us two options. You're either for us or you're against us. And and if if you're one of them, if you're one of those, if if you're a they, then you're an enemy. You just instantly define. But that means we can never agree with you. We, we can never side with you. We can never be on the same page because you're, you're a them. You're, you're, one, of, you're one of those. And, and that's what the devil tries to get us to do. He just so subtly, he just says, hey, you got to pick a side. you got to choose one of these very limited options. And so Joshua asks, he goes, hey, are you for us or are you for them? And I love it because the, 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 the angel, the, the, the commander of the Lord's army just says, no. I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's, not, that's not an answer, right? It's like asking your kids, do you want a hamburger or a hot dog? If they just say no, my kids just don't eat that night, right? It's, it's one or the other. But that's what he says. He looks at him and he says, hey, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he says, no, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. He looked at Joshua and he said, I'm not here for you. And God looks at me and God looks at you and he says, I'm not here for you. And you say, wait a minute. I thought Israelites were God's chosen people and, and we're, you know, as, as followers, God's, no, no, no. God's not here for us. God's not here to take our side, our team. We were made to serve him. We were made to serve God. We were made to honor God. Unity is not our idea. Unity is God's idea. It's God's plan for all of this. God, tell, it, tell us what you want us to do is what, what Joshua's essentially saying. And God says, well, the first thing I want you to do, I just want you to bow down and worship me. I want you to focus on me. I want you to stop looking at us and them. I want you to stop looking at what's in front of you. Just bow down, worship, and honor me. And then think of what they did right after that. They start walking around the city. They got to march around the city for seven days and seven times. And Joshua's going to be thinking, this is not what I had pictured. This is not my battle plan. And because it's not. It's God's battle. It's God's battle plan. And, and you think about it. You talk, you talk about how the devil has divided us. And that's what I want to do today. I want to look at this, this one particular way, but it really bridges across so many different areas of division. But, but the devil has convinced us that we're different, that we're divided. But I want to give you today, I want to give you five things that we can do now, that we can do immediately, that we can do today to be able to win together. Right? And so while we talk about division ethnically, it could be division through gender or through class or, or whatever it is. But these same principles we're going to talk about today, if we can begin to wrap our mind around, if we can understand them, then we can begin to cut down the biases in all the areas of our life. And so we start with this idea. We start with the idea that, that you and I have more in common than we have differences. Uh, I think back to when I first moved to ACU. Yes, this was long before they gave me the letter that said, please don't come back. But uh, applied to ACU, get in, uh, applied for housing, and did the whole potluck housing thing, where they just randomly, or they say it's randomly, uh, throw you together with different roommates. And so there were three of us in a four-bedroom apartment. They, they only could find three of us, I guess they thought, would, would make it together. But it was, it was a guy named Jean-Claude, a guy named Rajamal, and a guy named Dave Wynn. And they put the three of us together because all of our names to them sounded foreign. 
I guess they thought Wynn was, was Asian, was like Chinese or something. Now, they would never admit this, but I guarantee you, that's why we were together. Now, in truth, it's a guy from Haiti, a guy from the Fifth Ward in Houston, and a guy from a podunk, nothing, one stoplight. We didn't even have a stoplight. We had a stop sign in our town, small town farm in Oklahoma, right? We had nothing in common other than our name sounded funny. But you know what we discovered in living together? We had a lot in common. And as we took the time to know each other, as we began to see who each other was and hear our stories and our backgrounds and, and, and what we thought was going to be all these differences, what we discovered was we had far more in common than we have differences. Do you know if you do the Ancestry.com or the 23andMe or whatever these genetic tests you, you, you can do these days, you know what you're going to find out? Every one of us, is 99.5% genetically identical. Whether you're black or white or brown or yellow or whether you're, whether, whether you're tall or short, none of that matters. You and I, we are far more alike. We have far more in common, more similar than we are different. So why, why are we so divided then? Why is there so much division? The division. Well, uh, sociologists call it grouping, right? And 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 you can you can look this up. There's a lot of information out there about this idea of social grouping and and how we group ourselves. That there's an in group and there's an out group. And in groups and out groups, it's it's the way that we sort people into groups that are either like me or not like me, and thus creating an us. Versus them. Uh, and you know this. You, you can think of any examples. If you're a female, right? That's your group. And all of us males, we are your out group. And, and you know what it's like to be a female, and, and we don't. And so there's immediate differences. And, and because of this in-group, out-group, because there's the, this grouping occurs, you immediately know things about your in-group. You, you immediately have some connection. And, and we're all in multiple groups. If you're a female, you may also be in a mom group. And if you're a mom, you may be a grandma, right? And you have all these things in common. Or you may be in the tired group. Or you may be, right? We all have these groups and we all fit in. And, and once you've identified what your in-group is, you understand the variations of the people in your in-group. Uh, if you're a mom, you know what it's like to be a mom. But if you're not a mom, you don't know. Now, you can be pregnant, and that's a different group, but you still don't know what it is to be a, a mom. Because you hear, oh, you're going to have this beautiful baby girl, and you're picturing American Girl dolls and Barbies and bows and ribbons. And what you don't know is you're not going to take a shower for five weeks after you have that kid. That you're going to forget how to comb your hair. That you're going to be exhausted, right? Right? If you're not in the group, you have no clue what it's like to be in that group until you've lived it. And so whatever your, whatever your out group is, right, and we, we've all got them, we, we've all got those. And, and listen, skin color is one of those dividing groups. Once you've identified what your out group is, by definition, you don't understand who they are. You don't understand what they're going through. You don't know what it's like to be in that group because that's your out group. Men don't understand women. Women don't always understand men. We, there's a difference that you can't know until you have lived it. But once you've identified what your in-group is, well, then you begin to give some bias. Right? You begin to give some, some in-group biases. And in-group bias is just the tendency to give preferential treatment to the people considered like me. It's, it's your gender. It's, it's your football team. You know, listen, you, you start talking about it. Well, we cheer for this team or we cheer, you know, I can't cheer for those guys in Stillwater. I hate those people from Norman or, right? We, we immediately create separate. But if you find out somebody likes the same team as you, well, you immediately, let's go eat. You know, let's sit down. Let's, let's talk. Let's watch football. Let's get together, right? What town you're from? Well, I'm from Glenpool. Well, I'm from Jinx. Well, right? And then, I, I can't believe you would ever admit you're from, right? And, and we begin to make all these, these groups. 
And what, what McPherson does in his book is he gives these statements of what these in-group biases look like. So we'll put it on the screen. You can screenshot it. We'll make it available uh, on social media later. But just listen to these. I'm more comfortable with those like me. I'm more inclined to spend time socially with those like me. I am more patient with those like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those like me. I give more grace when mistakes are made by those who are like me. It's easier to communicate with those that are like me. I assume I will get along easier with those like me. I am more willing to go out of my way to help those who are like me. I possess more positive assumptions about those who are like me. Me, Whatever your team is, whatever your group is, this is just what we naturally do. This is just what what it becomes, whether it's race or gender or socioeconomic or the neighborhood we we live in or, or where we grew up from, right? You know this, your background, where you're from. You're from a different town, you're from a different city, especially if you're from somewhere that you think nobody's ever heard of. The second you find out that you have that in common, you're best friends, right? You got something to talk about. You, you know common people. You begin to share about who you know or a restaurant you went to or a place you stayed or something you saw. And, and that's what we do. Once, once we know, once we figure out our in group, this is just how we naturally behave. But the opposite is true as well. That if we have in-group biases, we also have out-group discriminations. Now listen, those aren't necessarily malicious. It's, it's not necessarily malicious. It's just what it is unless you intentionally resist it and acknowledge it. And, and as we'll talk about, that's, that's easy to do, but you've got to make that, you've got to be intentional about that. So this, the opposite is true for our out-group discrimination. I am less comfortable with those not like me. I am less inclined to spend time socially with those not like me. I am less patient with those not like me. I give the benefit of the doubt less to those not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those not like me. It's more difficult to communicate with those not like me, so I probably just avoid it all the way around. I don't assume I will get along with those not like me, and if I assume it, I won't, so I just don't. I am less willing to go out of my way to help those not like me, and I possess less positive assumptions about those not like me, which means I have more negative assumptions before I even meet you. And that's just, that's, that's something that we, we all have to evaluate. We've all got to look into our hearts and our minds. And we've got to search ourselves. And, and listen, we've got to ask the question, do I do that? And if you're a Christ follower, you've got to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, reveal this to me. Show me my heart. Show me my mind. Do I do this? Am, am I that? Because as we, as we look at our world and we can see the division and we can see the separation and we can see whether it's walking into Starbucks and you see somebody that looks different than you and that's the first thing you see about them or it's gender, you look and you say, okay, is that me? Am I doing that? Holy Spirit, will you reveal, will you change my heart? Will you help me see what it is I'm doing. But I told you, while, while this is one of the ways that, that the devil separates, I want to give you five things that help us avoid this, that help us bridge that gap, come back together, be unified, and help us win together. Five things that you can't just do, but you can do today. You can do right now. Number one, you've got to acknowledge your blind spots. Right? Blind spots are the things that you don't even know that you don't even know, right? right? You don't even know that you're supposed to know them, so you don't know that you don't know them. There's no way. And and one thing that I think is so big that that I'm constantly wrestling with, especially within the last couple of years, is that you can be racially offensive and not be a racist. Now, don't turn me off, because that's huge. That's so important because I think most of us would say, well, no, there's no way I'm a racist, right? I love all people. I'm accepting of all people, right? But yet I can still be racially 
offensive. And so while most people are going to say, no, there's no way I'm not racist, you can still do or say. And it's important because if you truly believe in your heart that you're not racist, then when someone says or tells you that you've done or said something racially offensive, you'll reject the idea. You won't listen. No, there's no way. There's no way I could have done that. And so when you reject that, right, you, you just completely uh, ignore the idea. And, and when you do that, you don't learn. And, and that's why we're here. We're here to learn. We're here to be better. We're here to give ourselves the opportunity to grow. And so we've got to understand those two things can be separate, right? I, just because I'm not arrested doesn't mean I still can't say something stupid. I still can't, I can still say something offensive, and, and it's not intended to be malicious, but it can still be offensive. And so today, you may hear some things, right? And you may, you may say, you know what? I didn't even, I didn't know that. Well, that's, that's fine. It's okay to not know it, but we've got to learn. We've got to grow. We've got to be better. We, we've got to begin to begin to practice being better. We've got to pray over this stuff. We've got to receive this information. Let me put it in a different context, right? Uh, and the ladies, ladies will know this, right? Ladies don't point if they're in the same room with you, but how many of you know a creepy guy? Right? There's, every lady knows a creepy guy. And, and, and listen, some of you guys are creepy and you don't know that you're, some of you do, some of you know it, but some of you don't know that you're creepy because you've been creepy your whole life, right? But if you want to know if you're a creepy guy, go ask a lady. Now, if you get anything other than immediate, no, not you. Like if you get a, well, you know, you really are. No, if you get anything other than a hard no, you're a creepy guy. You want to know if you're racially offensive? Go ask somebody of a different ethnicity than you. And listen, because you won't believe the amount of ignorance that people put up with. But if you ask, and if you listen, then it, it changes everything. It begins to change how we handle our interactions. We, we're given the opportunity to learn, to grow, right? And, and a lot of it comes from our social narrative. Our social narrative is a story to, that defines how we see the world. Uh, how many of you, raise your hand at home, in the car, in the coffee shop, how many of you are right-handed, right? See, I even raise my right hand, right? Because, listen, I'm proud to be right-handed. I love being right-handed. But how many lefties out there, right? You're just surviving, aren't you? You're just barely making it. See, I've got two daughters that are lefties. I had no clue the 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 overwhelming way that our world was designed for right-handed people until I had left-handed daughters. And I still don't get their perspective. Because, see, the world was made for me. I mean, all the way back in, in junior high, I go to slide at my desk, and I you know, just slide right in. And, and my desk, it was made for right-handed people. I could sit there and lean. I could write on my test. I could still talk to my friends or the cute girl to my left, right? Because the whole time I'm anchored on my right hand. But left-handed people, they're all out here in no man's land, right? They're just barely surviving. They're barely getting words on paper. Hey, be quiet. I can't talk right now. I'm trying to... Because the world was made for right-handed people. We shake with the right hand. If you're left-handed, you don't want to fix yourself for me, right? You want me to adhere to you. You want to shake... With a left hand, that's, that's the difference. See, the idea is that if, if you're right-handed, you go to a golf store, you're buying golf clubs off the rack. But if you're lefty, you're going to have to search for a little while. You're going to have to look around. Uh, Ella Grace, left-handed, plays softball. We go, to, we go to Dick's Sporting Goods. I can find any glove I want, catcher's mitt, first base mitt, anything for me for a right-handed. But you go to find a left-handed, you're going to five stores searching Amazon, and you still might not find what you need. So while y'all are all home playing catch, me and Ella Grace are driving all over town trying to find a left-handed first baseman's mitt, right? And you say, no, there's no way. It's not that hard. You're making this up. We, you think we're making it up because you've never experienced it. But if you've experienced it, you understand there is a right-handed privilege in the world. Right? And the idea is privilege is this advantage. And it's like this in any aspect all over the world. That the majority, when the, when the majority is in control, they make the rules for them. 
That you design everything for yourself. And so you don't understand what it's like to be disadvantaged. You don't understand what it's like to drive all over town looking for a left-handed first baseman. man. You don't understand that there is a disadvantage to being left-handed. Now, does that mean you don't like left-handed people? Not necessarily. But you can make the world easier by doing more, putting more gloves in the stores. Right? It, you could change the perspective. It doesn't mean you don't necessarily like left-handed people, but it means you have some blind spots. And you get those blind spots from your parents, from your friends, from your family, from, your, from the neighborhood. Right? And because we, we, get these, we get this social narrative and our blind spots all from the same place. And what the social narrative does is that it teaches us who's, who's safe and who's not. It teaches us who's smart and who's not. Who's a hard worker and who's not? And it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It just means that's the way we see it. That's, that's our perception, right? I have a brother and a sister. We were raised in the same home. We were given the same information, but we have different social narratives. We have different perspectives. There are 7 billion different perspectives in this world, and you can only essentially have yours. And they're all different because we experience different things. Our social narrative changes. So we've got to start by acknowledging our blind spots. But the second thing is, we've got to begin to rename those people as neighbor. Right? Number one command in the Bible. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and love your... The correct answer is neighbor, so we're going to try it again. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, we've got to begin to change the labels. We are bound by Jesus Christ to love God, to obey him, whether we feel like it or not. I'm going to love you, God. I'm going to do what you say. I, it's not about feelings. It's not about, so I'm going to love you. And the second one is like it. I'm going to love other people or I'm going to help them love you. Because that's what love is. Loving God is obeying him and loving others is helping them obey God too. That's why we talk about who's your one. It's not about church growth. It's about do you love other people enough to help them love God? Because that's who we're called. That's what we're bound by Jesus Christ to do. That we're going to love others whether we feel like it or not. Right? Because we got differences. And there are people that hate us. And there are people that I'm not going to like. But I'm commanded to love them. Love them no matter what. Love them enough to help them know God. To help them no, Jesus. So why? Why is there so much division in the church then? Well, because we're not loving people enough, first and foremost. But the, the other reason is because we take this idea of neighbor, we take this label of neighbor, and we replace it. We replace it with other names, with other words, when it applies to certain people. Right? In other words, that's not my neighbor. That's my white this, or my black this, or my Republican that, or, right? We, we change the labels. We change how we approach things, because what we do is, if we can not call them neighbor, if we can call them anything else, we dehumanize them. We, we begin to disqualify them for my love. I, I don't call them neighbor, because the Bible commanded me to love my neighbor, but if they're not my neighbor, if they're gay, straight, black, white, this, that, then I don't have to love them anymore, because I'm only commanded to love my neighbor, we're going to make a difference. If we're going to win together, if we're going to be unified the way God calls us to be unified, we've got to replace them, those people, with neighbor. Because calling them anything else is different. And listen, your culture, your family, society, it'll give you the labels. It'll give you the names that you can call them, or you'll give names that you can call others. But God says, listen, call them neighbor. Love your neighbor. Because, listen... Once you've labeled someone, you'll never see them above that label. Once, you, once you've named them anything else, once you've said, you know what, that person's mean, you'll never see them as anything but mean. That person's ugly, you'll never see them as cute. That person's stupid, you'll never see them as anybody smart. That person's lazy, you'll never see them as hard working. But yet God, the labels God uses for us are limitless. Once you call somebody son, daughter, Air, anointed one, like those are empowering. Those are powerful. Those are limitless labels. That's what God does for you and I, and that's what he wants us to do for each other. Hey, he says, call them family. Call them neighbor. Even when they're not, even when you think there's differences, even when you don't feel like it, change the labels to neighbor. 
because we are bound to love our neighbor as ourselves. Number three, give your in-group love to your out-group. Give your in-group love to your out-group. Now, this is hard because the second you do this, the second you begin to treat someone on your out-group like your in-group, your in-group's going to call you a sellout. They're, they're going to say you've compromised your beliefs. They're, they're going to say that, that you're, you, you, know, you don't have a backbone. You don't stand for anything. But listen to me. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. For you've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Or let me, let me change it up a little bit. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your outgroup. But I say to you, love your outgroup. Bless those who curse you in your outgroup. Do good to those who hate you in your outgroup. And pray for your outgroup who spitefully use you and persecute you. So you've got to, can you imagine if we actually go and we start looking for people that are different from us? And we say, you know what? I'm going to practice loving you like I love my friends. I, I am actively searching for people that I can love the way I love my friends. Because it's easy to love your friends. You don't, you don't need God for that. Listen, you don't need church for that. We, we come to church, we get together because this is where we talk about, this is where we get the power to do the things that we can't do on our own. You don't need God, you don't need church to love your friends. But to love outside your comfort zone, to love your out group, to love those who are not like you, the people that you, you avoid, the people that you stay away from, right? And, and think about it. You've got those people, people that, that you'll have them into your house, but you'd never go to their house, right? You'd, you'd help them because you want to be the Savior, but you'd never let them help you. Right? We've got to stop. We've got to start going outside of our comfort zones. We've got to start living out of our in-group. We, we've got to stop. In the, in the 1950s, banks did this, right? It was called redlining. And they would take a map, and they would just draw a big red circle around neighborhoods, and they'd say, we're not giving to that neighborhood. We're not loaning money there. We're not helping there. And listen, it still goes on today. It's, it's hidden better and, and done differently. But, but as a church, as Christians, no more redlining. Right? There's no line that says, I can't go love there, or, I can't ever agree with them, or I can't ever. We are called to love each other. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. We were all made in the image of God. So every group has problems. Every group has issues. We're different, but we're more same. We're more similar than we are different. We were all made in the image of God. So we've got to We've got to give our in-group love to our out-group. And number four, we've got to acknowledge our differences. Uh, one of the biggest things I've learned recently is this idea that you don't say, oh, I don't see color. Because right? if you say you don't see color, that's, that's saying, that's yeah, just devaluing people. That's saying, I don't, see your, I don't see your burden. I don't see your struggle. Listen, your eyes, are 90, they make up 90% of the activity in your brain. That we are a visual people. That what we see is what we process. We process motion and depth and shape. And yes, we process color. We see color. We, we, we've got to see color because that's how, we, that's how we keep from being offensive. If you tell somebody, oh, I don't see color, that's offensive. You need to see. Because if you don't see color, how do you know that they're a color you're not supposed to see? We, we see color. We acknowledge our differences. Because to not do that, say, I don't see you. I don't see your burden. I don't value what you've gone through. And you don't mean to be offensive when you do that, but yet, yet you are. Um, listen, I love, I love the, uh, the great theologian Fred G. Sanford. Uh, and if you don't know, you need to ask because uh, you had a sitcom, Sanford and Sons, and, and great. And, and there's an episode in which, in which Fred's a, a black man and, and junk man in the middle of L.A. And, and two cops come by because his establishment, his, his junk enterprise has been robbed. And they say, Mr. Sanford, was, was the perpetrator white or colored? And Fred Sanford pauses for just a moment. And he says, he was colored. He was colored white. See, culture says there's two options. You're either white or you're a person of color. Listen, there's, no, no, no. We've all got color. We've all got color. And we've got to acknowledge our differences. White, white's even a color, right? Let's make fun of ourselves for just a minute. White's actually four colors. Do you know that? Right? Because in the springtime, we're white. 
In the summertime, we're either brown or red lobster, right? In the winter, we're blue because we're cold. And then anytime we're embarrassed or mad or angry or a million other things, we're red, right? We're four colors. Every color has a burden. We've all got color. Each color has its burden. That's why the Bible says in Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If we say we ignore, we don't see color, we're ignoring each other's burdens. If I say I don't see your color, that's saying I don't want to deal with your burden. I don't value your burden. And that's, that's not what love looks like. That's not how we love one another. Imagine if we could just look at each other and respect and honor each other and help carry one another's burdens. And number five, give your heart to those not like you. Uh, A few years ago, Hall of Famer Rod Carew, who is a Panamanian baseball player, needed a heart and a kidney transplant. He was about, uh, I think he was 71 at the time. He's probably 76, 77 now. Uh, Rod Crew, 18-time All-Star MVP, lifetime batting average of 328. Uh, he just, just, he was the guy, right? And, and he needed a, he needed a heart and a kidney at the same time. And there was a white NFL football player by the name of Conrad Rulin who died of complications from a, from a brain aneurysm. And this white football player gave his heart and his kidney to this black baseball player. Uh, when Conrad was 11 years old, he actually met Rod Carew, went home, told his mom, said, I just met my hero. I'm going to be a professional athlete. He became a football player, not a baseball player. But after the transplant happened, uh, Conrad's mother called Rod Carew. She said, I think you have my son's heart and kidney. And he said, would you like to come listen to your son's Heartbeat. It's an amazing story. You can check it out on Sports Illustrated, ESPN. It's a wonderful story. But if we're so different, if we're if one is so superior than the other, then how does this white man's heart and kidney go into this black Panamanian baseball player and still work great and sustain life? If we're so different, see, that's how the devil has got us. He's got us duped. He's got us convinced. He's got us fooled that people are, are so different, and yet we are so fascinatingly made in the image of God. That God has fearfully and wonderfully created all of us. We're in different packages, but we can celebrate that. We can honor that. And if we're going to win together, if we're going to begin to do that, we've got to give our heart to people that are not like us. If we're going to win together, we've got to ask God, God, change my heart. Make me responsible for how I love God my neighbor. If we're going to win together, then we've got to bring heaven to earth. We've got to reestablish what God wanted from the very beginning. And Revelation gives us this amazing picture of this. From Revelation 7, it says, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, of all tribes, of all peoples, Of all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. When we focus on Jesus, when we adapt God's battle plan, when we look at Him and celebrate and worship and honor Him, we win together. Because we're loving him with our mind and our heart and our soul. And we're loving our neighbor as ourselves. We're helping others love God. That if we're going to win, we've got to love beyond our comfort zones. We've got to begin to see the biases that are in our heart. We've got to get to a place where we can forgive ourselves and be forgiven by God. And then we've got we've to move on. We've got to be better. We've got to continue to love our neighbor as ourselves. Listen, as a church, as individuals, winning together makes, it changes the world. It makes greater impact because it's so counter-cultural. It's exactly what Jesus did. And so he's called you and I to be. Heavenly Father, would you uh, thank you for the opportunity Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this, to have an honest conversation about some areas of life we've not won at. 
Some areas that, quite frankly, your people are losing at because we're avoiding, we're not, we're not having the conversation, we're not trying to be better. God, forgive us of our biases. Forgive us when we, when we say and do things that are offensive and insensitive. But God, thank you for the opportunity to love. Thank you for the opportunity to move forward. And, and day after day to love outside of our comfort zone. God, help us win together. Unity is not our idea. Unity is your battle plan to change the world. And it's all because of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. People come together, strange as neighbors. Our blood is one Children of generations Of every nation Of kingdom come Don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up high Don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from Oh, 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 oh It's in His blood Jesus, light of heaven Friend forever His kingdom come Don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up high Don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on Today's conversation, and, and I'm going to keep calling it that because it's in no means uh, me giving all the best information. It's sharing my heart, sharing where I'm at, 
sharing the resources that I'm looking into to be better and, and sharing it with you. And so let's keep this conversation going. If you've got questions, if you heard some things today that, that maybe were upsetting to you, maybe upsetting because why is a preacher saying that? Or maybe upsetting because Holy Spirit's working on your heart and, and there's something you need to explore and evaluate. Would you reach out to us? Let us know. Hit that digital connect card and just tell us where we can pray for you questions we can answer or how we can partner with you. Or listen, you may have shown today and and you didn't hear anything I said, but the worship moved you. The Holy Spirit's been moving you. God's been working on your heart and you need to take a next step. Let us know. We'll, We'll take that next step with you and help you in your spiritual journey. But whatever it is today, uh, let's keep these conversations going and join us again next week as we pick up part four of our winning series. Have a great week. God bless. We'll see you then.